Good. Okay. Well, in case anyone actually does watch this, uh, so we will, I guess, be picking up roughly where an AP Calculus BC course would start on like day one, or like an AB course would start like a month in, which is to say a rapid review of pre-calculus topics, which we've been talking about for a while, but this is the first one that we're recording. So we'll be doing some very kind of quick fun blitz questions on exponential functions, logarithms, trigonometry, and so forth, but it's at a somewhat higher level, I think, than AP Calculus, which is mostly about being able to compute and not knowing what's going on under the hood. So I, I think here we'll try to understand somewhat greater detail than the standard curriculum. So. Before we begin, I have included a fun quote by Jacques Hadamard, who's one of the great French physicists, and he said, the shortest path between two truths in the real domain, the real numbers, passes through the complex domain. Does that remind you of what, what uh, thing that we have discussed so far, if anything, does that remind you of? That's something I get the idea, and that's about it. But, uh... Do you remember how we proved that angle addition formula? Like, I don't know, cosine of alpha plus beta for two angles. Do you remember how the proof went for how we got this this formula with cosines and sines? I don't quite remember. It's been a while. Yeah, that was, I think, several meetings ago. Uh, it was kind of fun, because remember we used Euler's identity for each of the i theta, and then wrote, that was like cosine theta plus i sine theta. So we used that and then wrote the exponential of the sum of two angles in two different ways. So remember we wrote e to the i alpha plus beta and then simplified that using the rules for exponents that you could split this into e to the i alpha, e to the i beta. And even though at the end of the day, the formula we got involved no complex numbers, it was just a formula for cosine of alpha plus beta, but we kind of walked through the complex numbers by using this Euler identity to get there. So, I mean, that's what I think of when I read this quote, because the easiest way to derive that angle addition thing was to use the complex numbers. Does this ring a bell, this, uh, this derivation, or is it not sounding familiar? Kinda. Kinda, okay. Good enough. All right, so let's do a little warm-up question. So since we've been talking about logs, let's see if we could simplify this thing. So what is the log with the base square root of 3 of this number root 3 of 9? And you don't have to give the, the full solution right away, but if I wanted to start tackling this, what simplification or what first step or what thoughts pop into your brain when you look at this? All right, my first thought is the third root of 9 would be 9 to the power of 1 third. So I can take one third and effectively place it in front of the log, Good. base root three. So that's the log of a power type rule thing, right? So so it's a third log base root three, and I'm lagging a little bit. Uh, perhaps there. Yeah, this recording thing said like your computer should have at least a core i5 processor, and I have i3, so perhaps I'm being a little <laughs> ambitious here. But, uh, okay, it's working all right. Good, so that was the first step. Now what? And just off of obviousness, the root of 3 times the root of 3 is 3, so we need that twice, so it's root of 3 to the power of 4. So log base root of 3, 9 would be 4, and 4 times 1 third is 4 thirds. Good. So we've written this as root 3 to the 4th, because root 3 to the 4th is root 3, root 3, root 3, root 3. Each pair of those makes a 3, and two 3s multiply to a 9. So you said this is uh, 4 thirds, right? So good. OK, nice. Your, your log chops are in good shape. All right something a little harder. So the tricky thing about this problem is that the unknown quantity x appears in two places. So it's in the base of the log and also on the right side of the equation. So uh, th this might require a couple, a couple ideas or at attacks, but uh, any first thoughts or things your brain produces upon seeing this? 
All right, my first thoughts is we kind of did this in my, well, Algebra 2 class, and I had no idea how it worked. Ah, good, okay. Uh, so, do you remember the idea of the solution, or was it the same problem, or just a similar problem? A similar problem, solving for x. Okay. So, I think in this one it helps a little bit, maybe I'll just give the hint of, if we factor this thing inside the log, it might give us an idea about how to proceed. So to begin, 2216 is, let's see, twice 108. And then if I continued factoring 108, what would this look like? Processing. Oh, sorry, I, just, I think I just lost your audio. What did you say? Processing. So perhaps we could split it in half again. So if I pulled out a factor of two. Yeah. I was just trying to do a mental. <laughs> yeah, mathematicians are the ones that are worst at arithmetic. So if I pull out another two, what do I get left here? 54. 54. And then 54 is twice. This is going to be a very strange arrangement of equal signs, but... 54 is twice 27, I think, and 27 is 3 to the power 3. So let's try that. Uh, log base 2x, and now, let's see, this is 2 times 2 times 2 times 3 to the power 3. So I'm going to write that somewhat suggestively. So there's 3 powers of 2 and 3 powers of 3. So log base 2x of 2 cubed times 3 cubed equals x. I don't know why I put an equal sign here. This should be an arrow, I guess. Uh, OK. Thoughts on what to do at this step? Perhaps you can iterate through the log identities in your head, because there's actually a couple things you could do next, but uh, in, in any case we'll need to use some identity that the logarithm satisfies. Or the definition. I guess you could use the definition and just raise 2x to the power of either side if you really want. I guess I can try converting this to, well, like, the definition of logarithm just to see if that gives us any clues. Okay, yeah, I think that works. So if we use the definition of the log, which is that the log tells you the thing to which this must be raised to get the other side, what would I write on the next line using that definition? I believe you can write, uh, give me a sec. Just to make sure I understand what you mean by the definition, I'm assuming you mean this thing that if log base a of x equals b, then that means a raised to the power b equals x, I think, is that right? Yeah. Okay. I, I was a bit hesitant because taking 2x to the power of x felt weird, but that's exactly how it is, so. It is. <laughs> Let it be. I always get a no little con. nervous when I see 2x to the power x, but this might actually help us. Okay, so we have 2 to the 3 times 3 to the 3, and maybe it's even good to distribute this, not distribute, but kind of multiply out the power here, because this is saying 2 to the x times x to the x equals 2 to the 3 times 3 to the 3. Now this isn't your... Oh, this is quite amusing. <laughs> yeah, this is kind of solve by i. So solve by i, and what do you think? What value of x satisfies this? x must be 6 divided by 2. 
six divided by two, which is three. You said right? Yeah. Yeah. Good. I jokes. I don't even. Know. You just you algebraically obfuscated that to make me divide six by two in my head. <laughs> Thank you for that. <laughs> I don't need. I just pattern match this, where I'm like, all right, the left side has x's, where the right side has threes. Uh, okay, good. So I think that one's kind of fun because there's um, you can't just follow a series of steps to solve this. You kind of have to play around until you recognize a pattern. But uh, okay, thoughts or comments on this this blitz before we move on? This is amusing. I'm also amused. Okay. Uh, I. Wow, I mean, we solved that in one slide. I gave I gave us two slides, thinking we'd have to write more to get there, but it was not necessary. Uh, okay, this one has a fun story. This was from, I think it was my freshman year, when I started doing AOPS problems, and I quickly realized that high school teachers can't solve them, because I asked, I asked a teacher for help solving this, and I was given a statement which was incorrect, and I started to lose faith in, in high school education. So... Uh, so in the American public, uh, I can speech in the American public education system. I think. Yes, I mean, I don't know why I had faith in that to begin with, but this is where it started to go away. So, is it clear what this notation means? This is two raised to the power sixteen raised to the power x. So it's iterated exponents, and this is sixteen raised to the power two to the x. Maybe if I put parens, that would make it more obvious. But is it clear what what I mean by this? Yeah. Okay. I actually have an idea already. Good. What is the idea? Divide by two. Divide by two. Okay. So divide each side by two. I mean. So if I divide by two, then that's let's see, two to the sixteen to the x over two. So just like this, you mean equals. I believe that works, unless I don't know what I'm doing. Two to the x. Okay. So. What simplification do we get from doing that? So that would be 1 to the power of 16 to the power of x equals 8 to the power of 2 to the power of x. Uh, let's see, does that work? Uh, is it I don't. I don't quite know. So I think maybe a different way to think about this would be dividing by 2 is the same as multiplying by 2 to the power minus 1, right? Because 2 to the power minus 1 is a half. So... The left side is actually, when we simplify, is 2 to the power 16 to the x minus 1, right? Because we've multiplied by 2 to the minus 1, and multiplying exponents add. So we can't actually divide out. I think what you wanted to do was this, right? Is divide and kind yeah. of... Yeah, okay, I see what is up here. Because it's not like a coefficient, it's... Yeah. Yeah, because it's all raised to a power, so I don't think we can go straight through but it would be it would have been very nice if that worked uh okay so good the first see I, I one thing i really dislike about high school math is it gives you this impression that if you look at a problem and don't immediately know how to do it then you're somehow dumb but all of the interesting problems require several attempts before you get anywhere okay so it looked like that didn't didn't help us too much uh, other ideas I am currently looking at the title of this slot. Ah, good. I have hidden a hint. <laughs> so, what do you think based on the title? Well, obviously, we are probably going to use logarithms. Okay, so what base... So suppose I take the log of both sides of this equation, what base would you like to use? I guess log base 2 would work the best just because there's an obvious solution, at least for the left side. Yeah, so let's try that. Log base 2 of 2 to the 16. The problem with it, with this iterated exponentiation is you have to write it really big so you can make it clear, you know, because every time you raise to another power, you have to write the number smaller. Okay, log base 2 of 16 to the 2 to the x. Okay, so... We have two logs, so this is 2 raised to this whole power, and this is 16 raised to this whole power. Okay, so uh, you already alluded to it when you said obvious solution, but what simplification happens now? So since, well, 2 to the, two to the power of what equals 2 to the power of 16 x, 16 to the power of x, it's kind of already there that 
That would be, I can't quite word this quite right, just 16 to the power of x. Yeah, because this is, this is just a statement that log base 2 is the inverse function of 2 to the blah, right? Log base 2 eats this 2 to the blah. So good, on the left, we're left with 16 to the x. What happens on the right? I believe this would be a case of 2 to the power of 4 to the power, excuse me. I... Words are hard, man. Wait, did I lose you? I hear nothing. I don't know if push to talk. I'm here. Oh, okay. I believe that the right side would simplify to, well, since 2 to the power of 4 equals 16, I, this could probably simplify 4 to the power of 2 to the power of x? Possibly. 4 to the power of 2. So you're saying this would be 4 to the power of 2 to the x. Is that true? Uh... And that no longer feels right. It might be right, I just can't simplify in my head. So so let's, well, my pen's all screwed up. So let me just rewrite what you just said. So this is, now I'm going to need to write this really big. So you're saying, let's write 16 as 2 to the power 4. So this is 2 to the power 4, and that whole thing is raised to 2 to the x. Right, so then... I believe so. Okay, and then was the next step you were doing in your head to do this power to a power means multiply? Is that what you were doing? Or were you using the log of a power rule to pull that out? I wasn't quite sure what the, the step you were doing was. It was neither of those. Ah, okay, so... It was basically me hoping that it would be a case where it would just be... I don't... I have to describe it. Just 4 to the power of 2 to the power of x? I can't word that any better. Oh, I see what you're saying. So you were trying to say, alright, let's kill, let's use the log to kill that innermost thing, and then the answer should be 4 to the power 2 to the power x. But I don't think that's quite true, because uh, log base 2, if we rewrote this as 2 raised to some power, then we could get rid of the log outside. But right now, this is something which is not 2, raised to some power, so we can't just kill the log off, we have to simplify inside first. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. So, how would you propose to simplify the guts of this thing first? So this can, well, we can, as you said, uh, need to learn the names of these rules. Alright, the log of a power. I can, I believe I can just take the x out and Get the, the x or the 2 to the x? Resulting thing. Yeah, just go through all of those. Yeah, I think... And then we get an easy thing to work with. This the whole thing is 2 to the x log base 2. Yeah, the problem is the nested exponents. You have to be very careful about what's the power you're pulling out. So I think I agree that's true, right? Because I just split this into two pieces. There's the, the power piece and the base piece. Uh, okay. So then, Out of curiosity, why is it that um, the log of a power results in 2 to the power of x and not 2 as a coefficient to x? Uh, so you're saying why did this come out as 2 to the power x rather than 2 times x? Oh, because it's literally dragged out, never mind. Yeah, yeah, so the, 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 you just... It, it's weird because, I mean, you have to think of these as two numbers that are just like rolled, like this is a and this whole thing is b, right? This is log of a to the b, so the whole b comes out, which is basically what you just said, right? That's making more sense. Good. Yeah, because we don't have a rule for, like, a to the b to the c to the d, uh, so we have to kind of reduce it to the rule with just two numbers that we have. But two to the one to the one to the three. Yes, to the window to the wall. Uh, okay, so if we're happy with that step, what should I do with this, I guess we're almost done, but what do I do with this next line to simplify? And perhaps we can just evaluate this. Right, yeah, I can just evaluate that as you said. Good.
So that's in, I suggest four. Good. So now we have six. If we look at the far left and far right, we have sixteen to the x is four times two to the x, and maybe I mean we could. Well, maybe I'll, I'll ask you. So we could either take logs again, or we could try to write both sides as two raised to some power and just set the exponents equal, which is basically the same thing. So, which which do you prefer? Which seems more natural to you? I guess. Maybe Remind two. me what the options were. Ah, good. Well, okay. Let me rewrite this this side in a slightly more obvious way. So I'm just going to rewrite four as two to the two. So hopefully that's fine. And then I'm going to combine the powers. So this is two to the x plus two. All right. So so I made two suggestions about what to do next. We could either follow the title and just take the log base two again of the left and right side, or if you want to skip that step. I think there's an easier way to just rewrite 16 as 2 to some power and then compare the left and right sides. Either of them works, but I was just asking which, uh, or if you have a different way, that's fine too, but which would you prefer to do next? I feel like taking the log of both sides would probably be more easily understandable by me, but I don't quite know how to do that right now. Okay, well, I mean... Let's just follow our nose. So if if you say, what do you say? Just gonna think about that. Okay. Well, while you think, I'll just write it out explicitly. So if we take the log again, I'm just gonna do log base two because that seems to be working for us. So log base two of sixteen to the x, and compare that to the far right side, which is two to the power x plus two. So log base two of two to the x plus two. Okay. So Maybe you've already gotten a step ahead of me since you were thinking while I was writing. But uh, so, what should we do at this line to make our lives easier? I believe that once again we can t use the lock of a power rule on the left side to get x log base two of sixteen. I agree. X log base two of sixteen on the right side. And this would quickly simplify to x plus 2 for I. Should I describe it? Yeah, sure. Which, why is that true? I don't actually know. <laughs> I guess there's two ways to see it. You could either say, well, this is log of a power, so I pull out x plus 2, and then what's left inside is log base 2 of 2, which is 1. Or the other way is to say, well, the definition of a log is the quantity to which you must raise the argument to get the given number. So by definition, the number to which I must raise 2 in order to get 2 to the power x plus 2 is, of course, just x plus 2. Uh, either of those is fine. But you were probably thinking the second one, it sounded like, when you, you almost said by definition, I think, right? I... I just didn't want to say that it was like obvious. <laughs> yeah, that's fine. I mean, I'm very hesitant to use that term because uh, often people will say things are obvious in order to avoid explaining them. <laughs> so, good. That's a good habit. But okay, are you happy with why that's true now, though? Yes. Good. Okay. So now we're basically done. Uh, log base two of sixteen is four. So we have four x equals x plus two, and I assume you can just ding that off in your head, so what value of x satisfies? Hmm. <laughs> I fucking wonder. <laughs> I think it's two-thirds. Uh, I think it's... Let's see. Yeah, okay. Good. I almost did a dumb thing and thought it was three halves for a second, so I'm glad you said that. Good. Yeah, because... Divide, or sorry, subtract off the x, 3x is 2, divide by 3x is 2 thirds. Good. Alright, so that was, that was several steps, but uh, hopefully 
the procedure is clear. It's just that you can iterate applying the logs. Uh, thoughts or comments on this? Is it still cool? Still amused. Good. Okay. All right. Let's keep moving. These are these are supposed to be blitz type questions, which is a word for questions which I learned from my Russian colleague Alex, who likes the word blitz because he's Russian. Ah, uh, okay. Have you seen these functions before? Caution cinch. I have not. Oh, you are in for it a real very treat. interesting. Good. Okay. Well, uh, we will eventually, uh, by the end of this question, understand what these things are doing. But for now, these are just mystery functions. So they look like cosine and sine, except they have an H on the end. And they're pronounced kosh and cinch. And I've just defined them in terms of E. So we know what E is. We know how to raise E to powers. So I'm just going to have... I'm, I'm, I'm going to interject here. Cinch. <laughs> what, you don't like that word? <laughs> who, who thought this was a good idea? It gets worse. The, all of the standard hyperbolic functions have, or sorry, hyperbolic, trigonometric functions have versions with an H on the end. So for example, there's tanch, which is tangent with an H on the end. There's setch, which is secant with an H on the end. It's, it gets just terrible. I tried to write tanch, but my pen fucked up. Okay. Caution cinch. Cosh is the average of its argument alpha, e to the alpha, and e to the minus alpha. And cinch alpha is e to the alpha minus e to the minus alpha. So at this point, they're just mystery functions. I've just defined these things and told you nothing about them except for the suggestive title, A Taste of Space Time. So I will ask you, you don't have to do it on paper, but just tell me what to write down and what simplifications to do. Let's compute the square of cosh alpha. So take this whole thing quantity squared and then subtract the square of cinch alpha. And then we're going to FOIL out and simplify. But you're going to tell me what to write. So, what should I write first? Before I start that, I'm going to point out that I got cinch confused with lynch. <laughs> if there was a math function called lynch, I'd be I'd be done. <laughs> All right, back to the problem. Good. What should I write? You don't have to simplify anything. Just tell me the first step to write down before we do any work. I guess the starting point would be to take cosh and square it as a function. I don't know. That's yeah, so I'm, I'll just recopy everything up there. So there's a half e to the alpha plus e to the minus. Look at alpha. those brackets. They're nice big old brackets. So you said take that whole thing and square it, and then do the same thing with cinch, I guess. Yeah, it's going on. All right, e to the alpha minus e to the minus alpha, and big old brackets, whole thing squared. Okay, now we have to do some work. So, uh, what should I do to simplify the first set of brackets? This e to the alpha plus e to the minus alpha. When I square it, I guess I get a foil sort of thing going on. So, what do I get inside the first set? Absorb that into the bracket. Good. I'm. I believe that you can just foil this like any other equation. Yeah. Do you want me to write this twice to see how the foil would work, or can you just do it in your head? I don't see why not. Sure, you can write it twice. Okay. Uh, I'll square the one half to make life a little easier, so we don't have to worry about squaring that part. So a half squared is a fourth. So I'll write the one fourth, and then just to make it easier to foil by i, I'll just write this whole thing twice. Eventually, you'll get to the point where you just look at that, and you know your brain will automatically replace it by the foiled version. But all right, so I'll do that, and I'll do the same thing here, just for sake of democracy, we'll do it to everyone equally. Uh, I'm totally doing this to make you suffer. 
you were punishing me, okay? For absolutely nothing. No, I, I deserve it for for something that I've done, but okay. All right, so now I've written it twice. Uh, now, if I foil this out, what do I get in yellow for the first set of brackets? I believe this is a case of e to the power a to the power of two. Uh, let's see, so this is e to the alpha times e to the alpha, so what happens when I multiply two numbers with the same base? I think you said e to the alpha to the power 2, but isn't this... I, I think. Uh... I think when we multiply, we usually add the exponents, right? All right. <laughs> Good, okay, so not to the power 2, but multiplied by 2, right? Good. So e to the 2 alpha. Okay, so that's the first guy. What happens with this guy? That would zero out? Yeah, so it's e to the oh, power of zero. E to the power of zero. It's one. Good. Isn't that? So we get a one. What happens here? It would be another one. Good. And the last guy? And an e to the power negative 2a? Yeah, e to the minus 2 alpha. Good. I was having problems foiling because I kind of, at this point, don't remember how to foil for some reason. Oh no, it's one of those... Uh... I mean, I know, <laughs> I know what to do, I just didn't remember my exponent rules. Yeah, I guess this is in the learning theory called cognitive load, that if you introduce something new to someone and ask them to do something they already know how to do in the new context, they'll suddenly forget. Like, you know how to foil, but when you have to foil and do exponent rules at the same time, it's suddenly like, whoa, what's my name? What year is this? Uh, okay, well, hopefully we can do the second It's 2017, one. right? <laughs> yeah, something like that, plus or minus one. All right, hopefully this one, we see the pattern. So what are the terms in the second guy? E to the power two a. Good. E to the two alpha, and what else? Yeah, and then another plus one plus one. Well, now there's minus signs. Oh right? wait, wait, is that how it is? I don't know. This is a minus. So right. this, it isn't. Whoa. Good. So I think this should be minus one and minus another one because this is minus e to the power of minus alpha times e to the alpha, right? So. You agree that the exponents are as before, e to the minus alpha times e to the alpha is e to the zero, but we still have the minus sign left over. Right, that makes sense. Good. So what happens for the last guy? Because now there's two minus signs. So this would be just e to the power of negative two alpha? Good. e to the minus two alpha. All right, this is uh, looking a little messy, but I think now some simplifications happen because this whole thing in between the brackets comes with a minus sign, right? So I'm gonna, I don't know, do you think I should rewrite it or can I just go through and distribute this minus sign? Would you be happy if I just distribute that minus sign or should I rewrite it? I don't think you need to do either though. Oh, can you just tell me what, what happens next? Can you see it? Because the one fourth times something minus one fourth times. Wait, no. Is it the same way? Well, no. The okay. only difference is these minus. Yeah, signs. everything changes. Okay, I think. Yeah, you can distribute it if you like. Okay, maybe I'll just I'll rewrite it to make make life a little easier for you. So, I I think there's an overall. The one fourth multiplies everything. So I'm just gonna pull the overall one fourth out, so we don't have to worry about it. And then I'm just going to rewrite everything inside the parentheses, but distribute the minus sign. So I'll rewrite everything over here with the minus sign uh, through to make life easier. So here's all the stuff from the first group. e to the 2 alpha plus 2, combining 1 plus 1, <laughs> the simplest part of this problem, uh, plus e to the minus 2 alpha. Now here's the minus sign. So the minus comes in e to the 2 alpha. Now this is minus a minus 2 which is again a plus two, right? And now the minus distributes all the way over 
to the plus e to the minus 2 alpha. So there's a minus e to the minus 2 alpha. OK, happy with that, or is that too fast? I'm happy with this. As far as I can tell, literally everything zeroes out. Oh, wait, never mind. That's a 4 right there. Good, but I agree that all the e's cancel out, right? Yeah. So that's a little curious. The e to the plus 2 alpha, maybe I should use the same color. e to the plus 2 alpha cancels with the minus e to the 2 alpha plus e to the minus 2 alpha cancels with this. So inside we have a 4, outside we have a 1 fourth. One of my favorite numbers, what is this? 1 divided by 1. <laughs> Man, you've loved <laughs> saying things in complicated ways. It is 1. Uh, so just to remind ourselves, what did we just compute? We This was cosh, cosh alpha squared with a minus sign, cinch alpha. So what ordinary trigonometric identity for just cosine and sine does this remind you of? I believe this reminds me of the Pythagorean theorem. Yeah, so in particular, for ordinary with no h's, we still don't know what this mysterious h means, but we recall since uh, maybe I should use the angle theta. So, and you remember where this came from, right? This is just because this is a unit circle, so the x coordinate squared plus the y coordinate squared has to be 1, because that's the equation for a circle. So, for regular trig functions, we had this thing where we said cosine theta is going to be defined by the x coordinate on a circle and sine theta is going to be defined by the y coordinate on a circle and the equation for a circle is x squared plus y squared equals 1. Now I'll ask you, if we decide to define cosh as the x coordinate of something and define cinch as the y coordinate of something, what does this equation look like? My only idea so far would is that it's kind of like an imaginary variant. Yeah, that's actually a very insightful way to think about it. If you're saying this is somehow like a number whose square is negative, so it's imaginary. Right. Uh, yeah, I'll make a comment on that in a moment, because that's, a, that's a, a very deep insight, actually. For the moment, though, let's just leave this as a real variable and say Suppose this is the equation x squared minus y squared equals 1, right? So I'm just going to replace cosh and say, all right, by analogy with the ordinary cosine, we're going to suppose cosh is the x coordinate of something. So do you agree that if I make that definition and a similar one for cinch, the equation is now x squared minus y squared equals 1? I believe that. You think that's clear? OK. Now for the punchline. You've seen this before. This is the graph of a conic section. What conic section has the defining equation x squared minus y squared equals 1? I don't even know what a conic section... I have never graphed a conic section. Did you not just have a final project in that class about conic sections like parabolas and ellipses and circles? I, if this is one I haven't seen before... Well, let's let's just look at the graph. Is this just a, a is just just a, a, I can never speak. <laughs> it just is this a very complicated formula of something else? Yeah, it's not a complicated formula. Oh wait. This is uh let's just pick some points that are on this. So if x is 1 and y equals 0, that's a point on here, right? So 1 0 is on here. If x is minus 1 and y is 0, minus 1 squared is 1. Good, right? So these two points are on it. If I increase x by a little bit, so I'm going to go a little bit to the right. If I increase x by a little bit, then I think I need to increase y by a little bit as well so that the difference is still 1. So it starts to look like this. 
Have you seen this before? Oh. Well, we never graphed in hyperbolas. You never graphed hyperbolas, yet you had to walk around Jim Thorpe looking for hyperbolas? That is correct. Gee, this is worse than I thought. Uh, okay, sorry. I thought this would be a much more impactful takeaway when you saw that equation, because I assumed you had graphed these before. Damn. That is interesting, though, now that I actually know what this is. Uh, I, was, I planned this thinking, like, oh, this will be so exciting, but I was mistaken, because, oh, f that's not what I want. Come back, come back. Okay. Uh, yes. Blame the American education system. <laughs> well, if you had actually seen a graph... Wait, how how would you know when walking around? How did you know when you would see a hyperbola if you haven't graphed them yet? <laughs> because both the project paper and Google had pictures of them. Oh, that's disappointing. Okay, well, now we see this is the graph of a hyperbola. So now I will ask you, what does the H at the end of caution cinch stand for? I bet it stands for hyperbola, because they both have an H. Yes, so these functions are called the hyperbolic cosine and the hyperbolic sine. And the reason that wasn't supposed to work. Oh, you were just guessing? Yeah. Oh, no, well, your guess is correct. So these are, these are really interesting functions, because you might have asked, let's just go back to how we defined sine and cosine, right? Because... When we define sine and cosine, you were saying, let's just define the x and y coordinates of a point on the circle at a given angle. But you might have asked, what's so special about circles? We could label the points on any curve and ask what function gives me the x and y coordinate of a point on the curve. That's a really bad x-axis. So in this case, we said the x and y coordinate of a point at angle theta, cosine theta, sine theta. There, that's the x and y coordinate of a point on the circle. So now you could do the same thing and say, what are the x and y coordinate of a point on a hyperbola? And those are the hyperbolic cosine and the hyperbolic sine. So here's a point on the hyperbola. The x and y coordinates are cosh. And I, tip, I like to write this as alpha, cosh alpha and cinch alpha. Ooh, that's, I forgot the H. Uh, okay. Is that analogy clear so far? Yes. Okay. The one thing that's tricky about making this analogy is that there's no notion of angle on the hyperbola, right? Uh, it would be very weird to label these points by the angle they make with the axis, because you can see that once you go past 45 degrees, you, you, you miss the hyperbola, right? You don't hit it anymore. So you could ask the interesting question, what should we use instead of an angle to label these points on the hyperbola? Like what, what should alpha be to label these points? And the answer is quite interesting. Uh, you could say back in the circle case, you could say if we didn't want to use angle anymore, to label points on the circle, and we wanted to use something else, you could label it by how much area a sector encloses. So maybe I'll Oh, just... Jesus. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of interesting, though, right? So maybe I'll just ask you, if this angle's theta, this is very easy if you think about radians, but uh, if this angle's theta and the circle has radius 1, what is the area of the shaded orange region? I believe it would be pi divided by, wait, give me a sec. Maybe I'll split it into two pieces. So it's the area of the whole I circle. guess oh, sorry. pi divided by what, so, some way of expressing what percentage of the circle around that angle is. Perfect, yeah. So pi is the whole area, and then we want to multi multiply by the fraction that we have enclosed, right? So it should be pi multiplied by the fraction. The fraction should be the angle theta in radians, because we only use radians now, because we're not heathens, divided by how many radians are in the entire circle. Five. 
full circle 360 degrees in radians. Yeah, 2 pi. 2 pi. Good. I think. <laughs> exactly, yeah. You, you think correctly. So the pi's cancel, and this area is theta over 2, right? Whoa. Okay, so I mean, well, there's no magic there. That was just fractions. Uh, okay, well, we learned it's something. It's still cool. Yeah, I mean, I guess before we didn't know how to express the area of a wedge in terms of the radian measure, and now we have this very nice formula. You just take the number of radians and cut it in half, if it's a unit circle. So now that works way better for the hyperbola, because now we don't need angles anymore. We just define this nice property that take any point on the hyperbola, connect it to the origin by a straight line, and find the area. Find the area of this region, this orange region. And just like over here, it was theta over 2. I'm going to use a different variable and call this alpha over 2. Good. So if you do that, if you find that area and define it to be alpha over 2, and then take those functions we wrote down above, cosh and cinch, and plug in alpha, it will give you the x and y coordinates of a point on this hyperbola, which is quite magical, I think. So that's how to label points on a hyperbola. Find the area, and then plug in twice the area into cosh and cinch. But question, yes. wouldn't there be, on a hyperbola, wouldn't there be four different points that would work with that area? Ah, yes, okay, good. So you're saying, why, why wouldn't I go down here or why wouldn't I use the second, the, the second arm, basically? Right, that's, that's your question? Sure. Uh, good. So the first answer is, I think you're saying, why wouldn't I just go down here and say this point has area alpha over 2, so why wouldn't I pick this guy down here? Sure. Okay. Uh, that's a good question. The answer is... Based on what I've told you so far, that would still count. We're going to make a new definition where if a point is below the x-axis, we count this area as negative, right? Oh, boy. So if you plug a negative value into sine or cos, cosh or cinch, that will identify points below the axis on the hyperbola. So that's fine. And I think the standard convention is to choose cosh and cinch so they only label points on this right side. And to see why that's true, we can go back to the definitions. So cosh was a sum of two positive numbers, right? If you take e, which is roughly 2.78, and raise that to any power, that was one of our definitions of the exponential, actually, that it only outputs positive numbers, right? So cosh is only ever going to give you a positive x value, which means you're only ever going to be on the right side of the origin. So as we've defined it, we only label points on this arm of the hyperbola. Of course, you could just reverse it. You could put a minus sign in front if you want things on this arm. But I've just picked one component. Uh, yeah, does that answer the question? Is that what you're asking? Yeah. Good. Um, Okay, other, I think this is like super exciting. Other questions about this thing I've drawn? I have no questions. Okay, good. Then I want to go back to the, you actually jumped right to the punchline of the entire story when you identified that, I, that imaginary angle. So I want to come back to that now. Because in a certain very deep sense, a hyperbola should be thought of as a circle where one of the coordinates is imaginary. Because if we label these y and x, you can think of this as i, y, and x. Because when you square i, y, you get a minus sign. So the equation x squared plus y squared equals 1 turns into the equation x squared minus y squared equals 1 if y is imaginary. This sounds like just a fun mathematical game, but this is in one sentence the most important insight of Einstein's theory of special relativity. So That's quite a leap. I mean, yeah, well, sorry, this, you may not believe me, but I will attempt <laughs> to justify why this is true uh, with some pictures. So in ordinary space, the Pythagorean theorem tells us that if, uh, if this is x and this is y and this we'll call s, then s squared equals x squared plus y squared. 
And as it turns out, I mean, to really explain this properly, I'd have to tell, show you some experiments that reveal that a ruler which is moving very fast near the speed of light actually shortens. Not just appears to be shorter, but it is actually truly shorter. And a clock moving very fast near the speed of light actually slows down. Like, not just an illusion, time actually passes more slowly, according to someone moving at that speed. And the genius of Einstein was to think very carefully about these facts and realize that all of these strange observations that a moving ruler is shortened and a moving clock slows down can be explained if you just assume that time is a coordinate just like x or y on the plane, but it satisfies this very strange backwards Pythagorean identity that the distance along the hypotenuse has a minus sign in front of the time squared. This is very strange. Now distance squared can be negative if t is bigger than x. But in one equation, this is all of special relativity. Literally everything I just said, these strange results about rulers and clocks can be derived if you start from this. So in kind of more in theoretical physics, it's often convenient to use the same equations for regular Pythagorean space where s squared is x squared plus y squared and special relativity where the time has a minus sign. So we do what's called a wick rotation, which is to say you just take your coordinate like y and say I'm going to make it imaginary. Because perhaps you can see right away that if I define y equals i times t, this equation just turns into this equation, right? So when I plug in y equals i times t, this is i squared t squared, i squared is minus 1, so that's a minus t squared. And you might ask, why do I call this a rotation? Well, now this connects with this thing about Euler's theorem that we were talking about, because e to the power i pi over 2 is cosine pi over 2, which is 0, plus i sine pi over 2, which is i. So you can think of this variable substitution that just multiplies y by i. You can think of this as rotating by an angle pi over 2, which is 90 degrees. Right, just because of this e to the i times pi over 2 equals i. Okay, so, I mean, maybe it will be years before the full consequences of all of this uh, are clear and like, I don't know, uh, and you believe all the stuff I've said, but I just want to stress that already at the end of chapter one, we've done enough real mathematics that we can start to see some very deep truths about the universe. So thoughts or questions on this? The return is coming very fast. <laughs> Good, okay. Uh, is, this, is this sensible or like, is the idea sensible or is this just all very mysterious? I kind of understand what's going on. I want to think I understand at least. Okay, that's good. I mean, as long as the step the step is clear, because I think, well, I mean, I know that the idea is clear because you thought of the idea before I told you <laughs> of thinking of it as imaginary. So I think you at least get the point. Uh, good. Okay. I think, I mean, I think that's quite beautiful. But uh, all right. So with that, uh, a few more questions. I think we're like an hour in, but want to revisit because this last thing on the AOPS pretest, remember I said to do all of the things except the trigonometry part. So I just want to do a couple of these super fast since these should be kind of automatic for you. So what's sine pi over 6? Okay, so sine pi over 6 would be... And give me a second. That'd be a 3690 triangle, so... Sine is the y value. 0 0.5. Good. 0 0.5 or 1 half. I like fractions more than decimals. That still took me way too long. But yeah, totally. That's good. I admire you for oh. working it out from first principles, but this is one of the things that it's useful to have memorized. Uh, I cut you off. What were you going to say? So cos of pi over 2, well, cos is the x value, so 90 degrees would be 0. Good. How about this? 
Should I draw the circle for that one, or can you can you do it? I'm good. Let me think. Hmm. Ah. Now that I think of it, is there a proper way to handle these, well, trigonometric functions of strange... By strange, you mean outside the first quadrant, basically? Uh, like the 5 pi over 4. It's different from all the other ones, because it's not just pi in the um, numerator. Yeah, I see what you mean. Uh, usually, I mean... There's many ways to do it. The way I like to think about it is translate it to something which is in the first quadrant that has just pi in the numerator, and then adjust the sign as necessary. So what do I mean by that? 5 pi over 4, that means go pi, which is 180 degrees, and then go another pi over 4, right? Because pi plus pi over 4 is 5 pi over 4. So it means to go down here. Now, this is just like, I mean, this is a 45, 45, 90, right? Because this is pi over 4. So we can translate that by just kind of mirroring it and say, well, that's just like the one which is up here, which we know more easily. In the, and I changed color to black by accident. What a, what a goober. Okay. So that's like this one up here. And this is just pi over 4. So that one has just pi in the numerator, as you said. That's something that we know how to handle. So we can get the x and y coordinates of this point and then just kind of see that to get the, the, the one we're actually interested in, all you have to do is put minus signs in front of them because it flips it down here below the x-axis to the left of the, or below the y-axis to the left of the x-axis. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. Good. So what should I do then to get the tangent of 5 pi over 4? So tangent is sine of theta over cos of theta. So we'll give me a second to think. So that would be 1 root of 2 divided by 1 root 2? Yes. Yeah, so that doesn't seem quite right, but well, yeah, that's, totally. That's fine. I mean, it simplifies very nicely to one of my favorite numbers. <laughs> right. 1 over root 2 over 1 over yeah, root 2. Yeah, would just be 1. Good. And in fact, that's that's this one in the first quadrant, but that's also the thing we're interested in down here in the third quadrant, because if you just put minus signs in front of both of these, it's still one, right? That's cool. So that's just one. Good. Okay. So those are done. Um, let's see. Let's come back to these, because those are multiple steps. Let's do the last one, since I think we've seen in this enough times that hopefully your muscle memory is calibrated. So when you see something like this that involves a cosine and an I sine, there should be red flags and alarm bells going off in your brain. What should I use to rewrite that? I remember doing this in the past. Give me a sec. Okay. I'm in deep thinking. <laughs> Sorry, I'm just looking at Kieran talking about Jesus Christ rogues. Perhaps that's not. Uh, okay, so to help, what do you remember what Euler's identity is? This. this yeah. Should, okay, what should I write? What is Euler's I, identity? I'm just trying to think of how to put this into terms. Oh, I see. So you remember the identity. You're just thinking of how to apply it. Okay. Uh, but we could do it in steps. If you want, first, the thing inside parentheses kind of pattern matches. So I'll just, I, I'll assume you have this memorized because it's my favorite equation. So e to the i theta is cosine theta 
plus i sine theta. It's a very arrogant sentence I just said. <laughs> this is my favorite equation, so of course you have it memorized. Uh, okay, so what value of theta can we use so that that equation gives us an expression for the junk in parentheses? So I believe we can simply substitute this for, well, I think substitute is the right word, e to the power of i times pi over 12. Good. Yeah. So that's true simply because setting theta equal to pi over 12 in this equation tells us that e to the i pi over 12 is cosine pi over 12 plus i sine pi over 12, and that thing is exactly what's in parentheses. So that's in parentheses raised to the power 9. What do I do when I have a power to a power? You multiply, yeah. Good, so that's e to the power i times pi over 12 times nine. This is where I'm going to embarrass myself. Nine. Nine. What'd you say? Nine. Nine, nine, nine. Uh, I believe nine over 12 is three over four, <laughs> if I can do that. Okay, but we can simplify this. This is something we know. I'm just going to use Euler's identity again because I like it. And I'm going to change colors to orange. So. Whoa, this is getting cool. Yeah, so now we go back the way we came. Right? Cosine 3 pi over 4 plus i sine 3 pi over 4. And of course, you have these memorized, right? No, I'm just kidding. Uh, these are outside the first quadrant. Should I draw the circle, or can you can you evaluate this cosine and sine? Now I suddenly understand how to handle these three pi over four for some reason. Good. What are these then? So cos of well cosine of three pi over four would be uh, give me a sec one over root two, and sine of the same thing would be one over root two. Almost except. Remember, these are in the second quadrant, right? So be careful about signs. What are the... Ah, right. Sign. Wait, give me a sign. Which of the... Oh, by sign, I mean plus or minus. Oh. Not, not the uh, sign function. Right, the sign. I keep forgetting that the sign and... I keep forgetting that the cosine is... Um... Oh, God. Yeah, the cosine is the x value. Yeah, cosine I is think... x. So which one yeah, is okay. negative? So, cosine would be the negative one. Good, because we're in the second quadrant, so this is minus one over root two. Good, 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 good. Okay, so at the end of the day, what we found was cosine pi over 12 plus i sine pi over 12 is, or raised to the power 9 is minus one over root two plus i over root two which is really quite strange because you would think this is something raised to the ninth power so in principle this is you know something you would have to foil out nine different factors which could be quite complicated but it ends up being something very simple it just has these two terms and it's another example of the quote by Hadamard at the beginning that the shortest path between two truths in the real domain goes through the complex domain because this is really just saying that these two real parts uh, this thing raised to the ninth and the imaginary parts are equal but to get to that that kind of equivalence here, what we had to do was kind of go through the complex domain by rewriting this as e to the i junk and using power to a power. So I think that's quite cute. You use Euler twice. Uh, good. Thoughts on that? Can we simplify this further? Can we simplify? Well, it depends on what you mean by simplify. I hate high school algebra teachers who insist that to simplify this... Oh. You did kind of have the, the to the power of 9 there, so... Oh, sorry, about the, the power of 9? What do you mean? Yeah, don't we have to handle that somehow? No, that's done. Remember, because we had power to a power, so we multiplied that 9 in by the pi over 12. That's done. Oh, that's cool. Right about that. That's the nice thing. This is This is a general lesson that you should take to heart, that whenever you have a complex number raised to some power, rather than foiling out... It's almost always easier to use Euler's formula and write it as e to the i junk because power to a power is very easy. 
right, 9 times pi over 12 and simplifying that to, to 3 pi over 4, that's a much easier way of handling the 9 than, you know, multiplying something by itself 9 times. So that's done. This is actually the answer. We don't need to do any more work. That's pretty nice. It's quite elegant. But the comment I was about to make is that sometimes, I mean, no reasonable human would ever make you do this, but high school algebra classes sometimes insist that you have to rewrite 1 over root 2 as square root of 2 over 2. I, I despise this. So I, I mean, I'm just going to put this in parentheses because I don't think it's very important. That's what I thought you meant by simplify further. But uh, Oh, yeah, I didn't think of that until now. Yeah, Miss Mrs. Everyone would hate that. <laughs> Mrs. Insert surname here. Yeah, I mean, I love leaving radicals in the denominator because I think it just looks better. This looks stupid to me. Root 2 over 2, I don't know. This is just a personal opinion. Uh, okay. Let's sketch this graph really quick because I don't know if we've discussed... Do you know how graphs transform when you multiply or add by things in inside? So... Give me a second. Uh, I've mostly found these things by messing around on Desmos. So basically, a plus one in the um. I don't quite know how to actually word this. Basically, where an just an x normally would be if it was like a base function, adding a plus one would raise it up by one unit. Uh, that's if you add one outside, right? That would move it up in y. All right, so that would move it to the. I think I would move it to the right one. I always screw this up. Adding by one moves it to the left by one. And <sighs> the way to see that is that if the original function were... Let me draw it. That's a bad axis. So let's draw the original sine function. So sine is the one that's zero at zero, right? So that starts here, and then it goes like this. So this is sine x. Now, so this is sine x. Uh, so we're asking, what is sine of x plus 1? All right, so let's, let's think about this for a moment. Sine of x plus 1. Okay, so when x equals 0, when x equals 0, this new function, sine of x plus 1, has the value of sine x when we're at 1. So if this is 1, this is the value of the blue function sine x plus 1 at 0. So it looks like this, which means that we've actually moved to the left, right? We've moved the red curve to the left to get the purple curve. Is that clear? Yeah, this is cool. Okay. Yeah, so this, uh, it always screws me up because I think a positive sign should mean to the right, but you have to kind of draw the thing and see the way that it works. So adding one inside moves us to the left. So that's that's the first part. Um, what does the overall multiplication by three do? I believe that would... Uh, I don't... Okay, I'm thinking in terms of linear equations. So this would somehow increase the... Um, well, since this is a sine wave, I can safely say amplitude. Yes. Yeah, so this stretches it. The ordinary sine function goes from minus 1 to 1. This will stretch it so that it's from minus 3 to 3, right? So that I agree. And then finally, multiplying by 2 inside, that's going to double the frequency at which it oscillates, right? Because the old sine function, so sine of x repeats after a period of 2 pi. Sine of 2x goes twice as fast, so it's going to repeat after a period of pi. Is that obvious, or should I draw it? That's obvious. Okay, good. Okay, well, my my artistry skills leave much to be desired, so I will ask Stephen Wolfram to plot the overall y equals 3 times sine of 2x plus 1 in a moment, once my chrome loads. But, okay. Uh, in the meantime, let's just bang out this last one. So we've seen something like this before, actually. Uh, this question asks us to find all the thetas. This is going to be important. All thetas between 0 and 2 pi. 
such that sine theta plus cosine theta is cosine theta quantity squared equals three halves. And if you remember the last time we discussed this, there were kind of two ways I proposed, either taking the square root of both sides, which turned out to be a dead end, or foiling out the left side. So I will do that first step for you. If we foil out the left side, we get sine squared theta plus two sine theta cos theta plus, I'm going to strategically use the second line here to, to group terms, plus cosine squared of theta equals three halves. So what's the next step after I foiled out like that? I know that we've done this before, I just need to think about it. Yeah, that's fine, take your time. I will plot, I'll, I'll, I'll call up Stephen Wolfram while you think. I guess you do need to see it though. Totally missed my button there, said something. Okay, I feel like we've substituted the two sine theta, um, yeah, two sine theta cos theta for something before. I can't quite remember how yeah. it was. That's good, okay. That's basically where I want you to be because I don't think it's necessarily required at this stage to memorize all of the identities, but it's good that you saw this and had like a spidey sense go off thinking like there's an identity there's some identity that this is equal to something simpler. And then that's the point where you would just open up the book and look up the identity and you would realize, oh, there's this nice formula, sine of two theta equals two sine theta cosine theta. And then you would say, oh, good, that's exactly what I need in this problem, right? Because that, that makes this much easier to deal with. So supposing you have that formula at hand, then what happens? How do we deal with these other two terms in particular? All right, so because of our Pythagorean theorem, we can know that sine, sine squared of theta plus cos squared of theta equals one. Good. So this whole thing is one. So I'm gonna go ahead and just subtract one from both sides. So that kills off these, the genocides these terms, and that's the mathematically correct term. Oh God. <laughs> it genocides these two. Three halves minus one is one half. And I'm going to replace this using the formula. So then we have sine two theta equals one half. Now here's the trick. The last time we did this, I asked a slightly easier question. When we first did this, I said find a value of theta. Find a value of theta which makes this equation true. And that's because at that point I didn't want to cognitive overload you with identities and the fact that there are multiple solutions. Now we're going to go, we're going to put on our big boy pants and address the fact that there are multiple solutions to this. So we need to handle the fact that there are many angles between zero and two pi, such that sine of twice that angle is one half. So the first thing we need to do is ask ourselves which angles have sine of that angle equal to one half. So we're just gonna worry about the outside piece, not worrying about the two theta. But how many angles are there that have sine of that angle equal to plus one half? So the triangles I already know would be the 3690 triangle, which gets us results similar to what we're aiming for. Good. Okay. So using the 3690, which looks like this, I think, is what you're what you're getting at. So there's one here and one here. So you're saying from the 3690 triangle, there should be these two angles that have y values of Sorry, one half. Sorry, pause a second. I need to sure. do a 